Thanks for tuning in. We really hope that you enjoy our brand new video. If so, please leave a thumbs up or leave your comments just below. But for now, let's get started. Enjoy the show. Hello, this is Ranger Don from the US National Park Service. Welcome to Smack. Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Smack, your hospitality podcast. Today we are taking you on a journey to the US and we'll talk about some of its most beautiful places such as Yellowstone National Park or the Grand Canyon. My guest today is Donald Ledbetter, the tourism program manager at the National Park Service. And we talked about how overtourism affects their sites, in what way the agency is influenced when a new administration takes over, and he even shared a secret tip on which underrated national park we just have to see. So buckle up and enjoy the show. So Donald, welcome to the Smack Podcast. Thank you, Patrizia. It's wonderful to be here. I'm really flattered to have this opportunity. Well, it's us that is flattered or it's me. Um, and baby, let's just jump right in with a little icebreaker question that I thought of. Um, obviously, you know, when I knew that you were going to be my guest today, um, I just had to write that question down. And it's basically just what's your favorite national park experience that you've had? Because I imagine you must have been to so many like breathtaking, you know, um, places so is there anything top of your mind where you you know would say that this is for now the most uh, amazing experience you had great question i get that a lot and i think <laughs> for anyone who is in the travel or hospitality sector it's a difficult question isn't it so my answer is a little bit of a cheat I spent most of my 20s, about eight years or so, working on expedition cruise ships, very small mm -hmm. cruise vessels. I worked in a lodge in Wyoming. I was a camping tour guide. I led trips all over the United States and Canada. So during those years, I visited many national parks and public lands and other places, some of them multiple times. So really, the big memory for me is this kind of compressed experience. Just in a couple of years, I got to see... Glacier Bay National Park in Alaska from small cruise ships to Acadia National Park in Maine to the Everglades to Grand Canyon. So many of the, the wonders of our park system I got to see fairly quickly. So it's kind of a, a general impression I have of this very mm -hmm. busy couple of years that was very impactful on me. So yes, you just cheated. <laughs> <laughs> so If you had to just, you know, maybe something that surprised you or something that, you know, you, it's just a moment that you'll remember forever. Can you pin one down or is it really just impossible over those eight years? <laughs> I'll give you one. I mentioned Glacier Bay National Park mm -hmm. in Alaska. It's an incredible landscape. Much of the park is only accessible via water and cruise mm -hmm. ships do visit Glacier Bay. You can also kayak or paddle or take other smaller boats in Glacier Bay. And it's an amazing landscape where glaciers are meeting the water, are meeting the ocean that, mm -hmm. that's up in Glacier Bay. And especially on a small ship, it can be very quiet. So these very quiet moments of just sitting the boat in front of a glacier and watching it calving mm -hmm. and watching these cascades of ice break off, looking for bald eagles in the sky Uh, the silence of this very cold, you know, northern landscape mm -hmm. left a, a very strong impression on me. See, now you painted <laughs> a perfect picture for all of our listeners. Uh, and now I'm very happy with your answer. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much for sharing. that. It sounds amazing. Um, so let's let, dive a little bit deeper. Uh, we just heard you, you know, say that you're the tourism program manager. And that sounds great. But, you know, it's always what's most um, interesting for us is what's behind A title right so maybe you can take us on a little journey and just uh, tell us what a normal day in your life looks like and um, yeah just tell us a little bit about your to do's <laughs> sure sure yeah so I think tourism program manager I I've thought about changing that it's a little bit of a, <laughs> a misnomer I'm kind of a tourism analyst strategist subject matter expert for the U.S. National Park Service. So I work in our headquarters in Washington, D.C., and what I try to do is help the agency think strategically about tourism trends or networks or partnerships or data and statistics and what's going on in the larger context of travel and tourism and help us use that information to inform our planning, our decision-making, our 
partnership strategies. So a typical day, I might uh, do something that's kind of on my own. I might engage with a tourism industry nonprofit or association. For example, in the United States, there's a group called the American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Association. They work with tribes on tourism development, and we as an agency have a relationship with them. So I might be on a planning or a check-in call with Mm -hmm. that organization. Then I might pivot to a park-specific project. Let's say a park is analyzing what to do with a historic structure. Maybe it's a historic house that's part of a park unit that belong to some important historical figure. And they're trying to figure out how much should we invest in it? What might the house experience look like? And I might chip in a little bit and think about some tourism demand assessment, You know, kind mm-hmm. of think about the market assessment for that kind of experience. I might turn around and be putting together a presentation with some statistics and some forecasting and some kind of news about travel and tourism. I have a newsletter I publish every two weeks. So it's a variety of things I do to try to, again, help the agency think strategically and in an, in an informed way about tourism. Well, I think you should definitely change your title to like tourism expert and strategist <laughs> or something like that, because that sounds super, super interesting and also super important for, you know, the National Park Service Agency. So I really think uh, you should talk to someone higher up <laughs> to modify that, uh, that, that title, but super, super um diverse as well like your mm-hmm. you know your your um activities and um maybe to just zoom out a little bit um, now you talked about your position but just for us and our like our listeners to understand what does it like what do the national park services do like what kind of what does it cover because i think it's it doesn't only cover like national parks but also historic sites like you just said right so um maybe yeah just If you could explain a little bit the scope of what you guys um, are in charge of. Yeah, absolutely. So in the United States, the National Parks actually came before the National Park Service. Mm-hmm. So the, the first national park was established in 1872, and that was Yellowstone National mm-hmm. Park, world famous, right? This bureau wasn't established until 1916. So there was a period <laughs> of time where we had about yeah. 30-something national parks without a bureau that was managing Mm -hmm. them all together. They were managed by other agencies and the the federal government. So this agency, the National Park Service, has been around for 107 Mm -hmm. years or so. And we are part of a larger cabinet in the United States called the Department of the Interior. And that larger department has responsibility for lots of public lands and waters in the United States, lots of different uses from energy production to fish and wildlife management to protected areas like national parks. So we are an agency that manages this national park system. It's the most famous part of what we do. And that system has 424 units in the entire system. It's very big. I think it's a lot bigger than, than most people are aware of. And like you said, more than national parks, we have national historic sites, national monuments, national recreation areas, national lake shores and seashores and battlefields. We have all of these different designations, but they're all equal members of the park system. They're all amazing places that protect really unique geographic features or ecosystems or geologic features or archaeological sites or historic sites, places where history took place in the United States, pre-Columbian history as well. Um, places where people struggle for equal rights, Mm -hmm. for workers' rights, places of great invention and creativity, like Thomas Edison's workshop is Mm -hmm. part of the national park system. So it's a very diverse system that includes both kind of the um, stereotypical big landscape parks that you think of. What everyone thinks of. Yeah, but also those historic and cultural sites as well. Super, super interesting. And at the beginning, you said, you know, like you explained the system of how like you belong to... um, the Department of the Interior and everything. So it sounds very hierarchical and very kind of complex. So do you sometimes feel like you are bound by a lot of rules and a lot of kind of steps in your daily work that you have to adhere to? Or do you like, do you have the freedom kind of to to decide um, your own kind of strategies and what you want to put in place? Or is it really like it sounds, you know, very complex and and also a bit bureaucratic, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is very bureaucratic. We are a government agency. So mm-hmm. yes, we are bound by rules. Mm-hmm. You know, as a government agency, we can't do anything that we haven't explicitly been told we can do by law. 
Mm-hmm. You know, we are we are governed by the laws that are passed by the United States Congress. So these big laws come out. There are a great many of them that inform how we operate as an agency. And those get translated into policies and then actions. However, within that broader parameter of these laws, there is a lot of room for flexibility and creativity. Okay. You know, I work with parks to improve our collaborative relationships with local tourism networks, mm-hmm. you know, destination marketing and management organizations and, and the like. There's nothing that says we have to do that. There are some general um, directions that we should collaborate with stakeholders and with communities, but there's freedom to mm-hmm. implement that creatively and try to get better at it and, and mm-hmm. be creative within it and improve it. So it is political, okay. absolutely. Okay. We're, we're part of so a government So it sounds agency. like you can at least choose also, you know, where you put your energy in, where you focus on and, and what kind of... Um, communities you would like to uh yeah contact and reach out to so okay so a good mix let's say of rules and laws and also some freedom but how much for example then does it affect you if there's a new you know political term starting and you know everyone like kind of congress and everything is is being set up in in a new way do you feel that immediately or does it just trickle down eventually and not even that much maybe in your daily life mm. that that is how it works here if we go from one administration to another we are part of the executive branch in the united states which is overseen by which includes the white house mm-hmm. and so in all of the agencies the cabinet agencies and, and departments there's a cadre of political appointees and so when a new administration comes in there is this kind of revolving door of all mm-hmm. the people that were political appointees in one administration leave, leave their jobs and a new cadre comes in. And that's how an incoming administration does make policy changes and gives new directions for what the agency should be doing. So this is my third administration I've mm-hmm. worked under since being with the National Park Service. And yes, you do feel you know a change, a change in priorities, a change in direction. Now, I will say there are other agencies within the Department of the Interior that will probably swing more widely. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I mentioned other agencies that work on energy production. And it's true. Yeah, Yeah, one administration could be prioritizing renewable wind and solar. Another might prioritize fossil fuel production. So that's a pretty big swing, right? For us at the National Park Service, I'd say it's not quite as much of a a swing you know, these parks are, are pretty well established by law. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of agreed on. We're, we're protecting these places. They're part of the system. So it's just a little more, I think, of a more nuanced changes within those parameters, maybe a different area of focus, maybe how we're working with the private sector versus mm-hmm. uh, nonprofits, just different kind of philosophies within that larger parameter. Mm-hmm. And is there one change that you can share maybe now um, when changing from the Trump administration to the Biden administration? Or is that too like detailed (laughs) to be able to pick one no no i can pick one you know diversity relevancy inclusion accessibility you know these are important priorities for the biden administration Mm -hmm. environmental justice is a, Mm -hmm. a challenging issue in the united states and i think around the world you know communities have been impacted by environmental pollution or the impacts of, of um, you know, capitalism and, and, and mm-hmm. manufacturing economies in different ways. And parks can be part of the solution for that, you know, access to parks, connectivity to parks, um, making people feel like they have ownership of their national park system. Because the system, you know, like I said, it is broad and includes many, many parks that are embedded in communities that are kind of close to home, quote unquote, for many people. So that's that's a, a little more of a focus in the in this administration for sure, is strong ties with uh, underserved communities, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, I also read that on, on the website, actually, when I, you know, did my little research that you, like you just said, support uh, tribes, for example, in revitalizing their communities. Um, and I, I, I read that and I was like, okay, I would love to learn a bit more about how that looks in in action, so to say. Um, So maybe can you tell me a little bit about how, like what certain activities or um, approaches are that you guys do? Absolutely. And for that question, I'm glad you asked because I get to highlight some of the other work that the National Park Service does. Mm -hmm. In addition to the National Park System, 
we also manage a variety of grant programs and technical assistance programs and other funding mechanisms Mm -hmm. that work in a wide variety of communities across the United States. So not at all limited to being proximate to parks or even (laughs) even near parks. It can be, we've worked in practically every zip code in the United States. So one example is we have a technical assistance program, a little wonky, but it's called uh, uh, Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of experts at the Park Service who are experts in revitalizing and rejuvenating and increasing and improving access to rivers, Mm -hmm. trail systems, forests, you know, other ecosystems. Well, we'll bring that expertise out into a community. You know, say Mm -hmm. a community has a, maybe it used to be a manufacturing site of some sort, you know, a brownfield that they want to convert into more of a green space and improve the access to the rivers. A lot of rivers in the United States used to be more about access to commerce and shipping. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, you know, rivers were were focused on manufacturing and agriculture and shipping. Now communities, those are, you know, being taking place in different places. So communities want to reclaim their rivers and access to those rivers. So we're working, for example, along the Ohio River outside of Cincinnati, Ohio and Kentucky Mm -hmm. at revitalizing these river communities so they can increase recreation on the river. You know, it's, it's for, uh, it's health, public health Mm -hmm. needs, giving people Mm -hmm. access to these places and economic development because, you know, recreation, particularly close to home, these are recreation assets. So it's that kind of work that brings us often into a wide range of communities. Super interesting. Because I, I understood it uh, like the other way around, kind of that you you know you also um, help certain let's say communities that are maybe close to um, national parks to to interact with nature and and you know for for example the um, maybe a kids program or something like that which which I'm sure you also do um, but I didn't think of the other way around which you just explained so that's really interesting because of course. Um, your experts are needed in these kind of scenarios that you just explained. Um, and it's great that you put also effort in in that because I don't know I don't know how much I mean, of course it helps you because then uh, they know that what kind of expertise you have. Um, but it's it's probably less self-serving than attracting people to your parks, but you're just giving your knowledge and your your skills kind of away and giving back to to other communities that are not at all, like you said, close um to your to your sites. So really, really interesting. Yeah, that's right. And and I will just mention to highlight mm-hmm. what you said, which is that that work in the communities that are close to parks, that definitely happens too. You know, we have a lot of youth partnerships and nonprofit partnerships. It's not just the tourism management. You know, of course, we're working with the communities closely on tourism and visitor management. But then it's also that connectivity, you know, of community and community residents, you know, to, to the parks that are right there, you know, embedded in or adjacent to their communities. So, yeah, it's that full kind of um, full spectrum of community work. And you just said before, um, at the beginning of our deep dive into the National Park Services, that, uh, you know, there's already so many different parks and sites and uh, in your kind of roster. So are there still um, sites of interest being added to your um, kind of system or even excluded, maybe? So they fall off because they don't, they don't fulfill certain criteria that you, that you have? Or how do we, you know, need to imagine that? Great question. So the way we protect and interpret and tell the story of America never stops, right? Mm-hmm. You know, there's always new stories that need to be told. There are movements that need to be acknowledged. It's kind of a process in the United States. It's how we reflect upon ourselves as a society and improve as a society, I would argue. That's especially true for the more historic and, and uh, heritage-based sites mm-hmm. that enter the system. So there's always things that need to be told and, and protected and recognized. So the national park system definitely continues to grow. I would say it is more rare now mm-hmm. to add kind of large landscape parks. That's not, yeah. it could, it, it could happen. But I think in this day and age, that's a little more difficult. You have a, a much greater patchwork of mm-hmm. state lands and private lands. And, you know, that opportunity is, isn't as present anymore. So you do see more often now the new units that are being added are more of that historic or, or heritage cultural kind of story. 
the newest unit in the park system is a historic site in the state of Illinois. It was a planned community. It was the first community to be established through a legal process working with the state of Illinois uh, before the Civil War by an Mm African-American. So it's a really interesting little piece of African-American history in this country. And so highlighting stories like that, that are lesser known, that are, that are unknown, it's a way to tell a more full story uh, of this country. And so that's the kind of site that, that is a little more commonly being added these days. Mm-hmm. And in this case, did you guys kind of find that unit or did someone approach you, told you the story and uh, kind of, you know, got your interest? <laughs> Usually the road to becoming part of the national park system is long. Mm -hmm. So it can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, Sometimes there might be a local constituency, a local community, a group of people with an affinity uh, to some story or to some site or to some part of the landscape. They'll start to kind of agitate, or that's not the right word. They'll they'll promote and advocate, advocates Mm -hmm. the right word for nominating or for, for, having this site added to the national park system that can get political traction and that's where the pace might really pick up now Mm -hmm. typically we are asked to do a study to determine the eligibility um to kind of review some criteria and we do have some set criteria you know Mm -hmm. does it meet x y and z criteria that makes it kind of i don't want to use the word worthy But, you know, that makes it, it, yeah, yeah, it makes it worth, you know, putting in that national park system because there are other options. It could be a state historical site. Mm -hmm. It could be on the National Register of Historic Places. It could be a private site. There are all these different ways, you know, to protect and and interpret, um, you know, different parts of history and heritage. So we're asked to do those kinds of studies, typically by Congress. Um, It's just advice on our part. Congress can (laughs) actually act, you know, um, you know, if they see fit. And so there are two ways something can be added to the park system. It's either an act of Congress or the president. The president has a proclamation mm. um, ability to, to uh, declare national monuments. Do you remember uh, a time where that happened? Where the president just picked a size oh, to be added? I, yeah, I mean, President Biden, he's done it at, at least, I'm thinking one, two, three, four. Gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to remember off the top of my head how many times he's done it, but it's pretty typical in most administrations. The president will declare at least a handful of national monuments. Some administrations more than others just depends on how much of a priority or a thing it is mm-hmm. for them. So if you, even if you don't agree, you just have to add it then? Well, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds about, you know, <laughs> agree or not agree. You know, let, let's just say Congress and the, and the White House, you know, they have the ability to establish mm-hmm. new units of the of the park system. And we advise, you know, we give we give our opinion. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the Park Service. The, some of those other agencies I mentioned, the Fish and Wildlife Service, mm-hmm. Bureau of Land Management, they also can have units added in the same kind of manner. Mm-hmm. Super, super interesting. <laughs> and um, so at the beginning of, of the episode, you mentioned that, you know, you ha- held different positions throughout your career, um, had the chance to see so many interesting places and also worked for quite a bit in the cruise industry. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that time in your life and also how you can today draw on that th- those experiences because you know I, I would imagine it's it's also quite different in terms of let's call it the product um, that you were in um, but so yeah I'm just in, I'm just interested in that kind of also switch in your in your career and what you what you learned and and, and what you can still today use. Sure. No, that was an incredible experience, obviously, in period of my life. Right after college, mm-hmm. I went to work for a small ship cruise line. It was called Clipper Cruise Line. They're out of business now, unfortunately, oh. but I worked for them for a couple of years. I then worked for a small company called Cruise West. Mm-hmm. They're also out of business. I don't know. There's a pattern here. There is a pattern. You leave uh, and yeah. they go bankrupt. That's I just don't know. what happens. <laughs> and I also worked for Lindblad Expeditions. That's very much still around. <laughs> and it was a remarkable period of my life. I, I got on board not that long after college graduation as a steward. I waited tables. I cleaned mm-hmm. cabins. It was the most entry-level work. And I had no 
problem doing it because I got to do this incredible travel and these, these incredible experiences. I did only work on small ships. Mm-hmm. So I, I never worked in the big ship sector. That's not something that would appeal to me. I, I only worked on the small vessels that were very much about where we were. Mm-hmm. And we did uh, walks, historic walking tours when we were in port. We did hikes in the Caribbean and in Mexico and Alaska and in Central America when we were there. We had historians on board and naturalists on board. We're doing wildlife viewing. We have lectures and presentations in the lounge. I sat through a great many of those. So really, for me, it's actually a pretty through – there's a connection, clearly, Mm -hmm. from that experience of – getting exposed to what I would call a more sustainable approach mm-hmm. to travel, very focused on the destination, somewhat small scale, working with local companies mm-hmm. and local operators. I see a through line, you know, very much from that experience mm-hmm. to working for the National Park Service. And the camping tour guide work I did, very similar, small scale company, small group tours, very authentic. I mean, I was 24 years old, you know, and I was their tour guide <laughs> to, to sometimes to places I'd never been before. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to you know, lead them to, you know, Tor- Toronto or whatever it was and kind of wing it a little bit. But that's what you get at that, you know, that price point. And, and at that age, it was a lot of fun. It was really great. So no, it very much opened my eyes to number one, what the impacts of tourism can be. Mm-hmm. You know, I very much saw for example, large cruise ships and, and those kinds of operations, less sustainable destinations and the impacts of them. And as a traveler myself, so I got exposed to all of that in my 20s. And that did very much inform my philosophy and, and the way I want to work in the travel industry. Mm-hmm. It's super interesting because, of course, my mind immediately went to, you know, the big cruise ships and that kind of approach to um, traveling by boat, uh, there. Okay, we're gonna stop here. You all have, I don't know, twenty four hours. Come back at that and that time, and then we leave again. And it's very much like a drop off kind of approach where there's not a face to face or or a kind of a taking by the hand and really showing the guests or or the travelers, you know, what what it means to be in this place and what significance is behind it. So. I'm I'm glad to hear that you um, had such a different kind of approach, like the companies you worked for, you know, it sounds very much, like you said, more authentic and also more memorable, I'd say. Um, and I can definitely see the red thread throughout your, you know, the next steps you took. Um, and and now you get to just do it on a, on a much larger scale. And like you said, um, consult these different Uh, units that you have Uh, but you mentioned you know the the effects of tourism and one big thing of course that uh, we always have to talk about a little bit as well is is over tourism uh, which I'm sure you're also confronted with in some of your units for example you know Yellowstone you just mentioned before or Yosemite where you know everyone knows it everyone wants to go I'm sure that you have crazy peak times And uh, it would be really interesting to learn a bit more about how you approach it, how you manage it, also how it maybe changed over the past uh, years or decades. Um, Yeah. Well, I will say very briefly, just Mm -hmm. to to give a shout out, we do work with the large cruise ships in the national Mm -hmm. park system, you know, just to acknowledge it, you know, we have them under concession contracts and other kinds of permits. And we actually proactively work with them to limit their emissions and improve Mm -hmm. their fuel economy to behave well around wildlife and animals. So just to acknowledge, you know, that that the the big ship sector, you know, is very much present and and something we work with in the in the park service. Great question about visitation and the management of visitation. I think if you go way, way back and expand big picture and think about national parks and how they're structured, you know, there are very basic aspects to how you manage that interface of people and wildlife and nature. It's where you put the roads. Where are the roads routed? Where are the visitor centers? Where are the parking lots? Where are the trails? How do you manage all of those things? And one really interesting thing about the U.S. national park system is that a lot of the roads in the park system were built decades ago Mm -hmm. when our knowledge and the sophistication of what we knew about the complexity of ecosystems 
wasn't as much of a priority and wasn't as, as, as full. We didn't know as much as we know today, for example. They were built very much for their scenic views, mm-hmm. you know, for the viewscape and that touring experience. It's true. They were very much built, especially in the 50s and the 60s, post-World War II, for that kind of automobile touring experience. And we've subsequently made changes as we've become more sophisticated and attuned to the needs of ecosystem protection. So in Yosemite, for example, there's an area called the Mariposa Grove, which is Mm -hmm. these old, gigantic trees, absolutely gorgeous, just stunning. There used to be a road. I mean, that's a a road is is too expansive (laughs) to describe, a a track that wound its way among the trees. And we had a tour. We had a little like tour mobile, right, with with a a driver up front, like little carts. And and you you sat in this and it it wound its way among the trees. A couple of years ago, we launched a big project. We removed all of that. We took Mm -hmm. all of that out and we moved the parking lot from Mariposa Grove much further away from the Grove. And there's a little shuttle that will go from the parking lot to the Grove, but it's now an experience on foot. Mm -hmm. It is an experience that you're going to have on foot in the quiet of nature. We do have handicap parking um, closer to the Grove. You know, we do make allowances for accessibility, of course. So there are changes that we make over time in terms of how we're managing that human and wildlife and landscape interface. So there are challenges, certainly. There are some parks that are extremely popular Mm -hmm. and that have really received big increases in visitation. And we are tackling how to manage that. Managed access is kind of the term that we'll use. And the way I try to describe it is to just kind of acknowledge that managed access is not a new concept at all in the, in the park system. You know, we have caves that are part of the park system. Well, we don't let people just run through the caves by themselves anytime, right? We have guided tours and we have walkways and things like that. It's managed access. We manage the backcountry in parks. So that's the catch all term for areas that are away from paved surfaces. You hit the trails and head out into the backcountry. Mm-hmm. Many parks have backcountry with no trails. And so it's just kind of wilderness. A lot of those areas, you need a permit, you need a camping or even a hiking, you know, backcountry permit. So we're managing the access into those more pristine parts of the ecosystem because we're trying to keep them in a certain condition. A lot of the places where you see that crowding and that heavy visitor impact is what is in what we would call the front country. You know, Mm -hmm. these are the parts of the park that have kind of been hardened with parking lots and with visitor centers and with roads and whatnot. So it's not like that, that can impact the ecosystem, of course, but it's a little different. You know, these are meant, these are built to be visited. You know, they're, they're meant to handle a lot of people coming in. It's more the quality of the visitor experience, I would say, goes down when the crowding gets to be too much. Mm -hmm. Safety, We've had safety issues on trails, you know, on safe numbers of people crowding trails, some of which can be steep, some of which can be technically difficult. You mentioned Half Dome. We have a permit system to hike up the back of Half Dome. You have to have a a permit for for doing it that day because otherwise the numbers would be too great. Mm -hmm. So I think that, again, high levels of crowding absolutely can impact the ecosystems. I think, though, and I'm not a scientist, so I don't want to say this definitively on behalf of the Park Service, but I think that things like climate change and those like macro factors are having more of an impact on the range of animals on, you know, the um, uh, wildfires and the frequency Mm -hmm. and intensity of wildfires, the melting of glaciers, this crowding in the front country. I think the, the challenges that are more of a priority are the visitor experience, safety, certainly trail erosion and social trails and those, those sorts of things, of course. And we're trying to wrap our arms around some of that managed access. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when it comes, for example, to like waste management, do you or like, you know, when you issue those permits for, for example, also the, the back country, um, how do you, I mean, I, I'd imagine it's really hard to kind of observe and and t- keep track of these people and if they litter or if they don't litter and if they pick up their things and and so the impact on on the raw nature must be really hard to monitor um of course in in the front country how you call it it's probably a bit easier and you can you can work with signage and you know a lot of uh, trash cans everywhere and really just give fines to people if they don't adhere to it but 
yeah, is that is that also something where you made some changes over the past years or where you see that you need to maybe modify some things? Well, I think it is very different, the approach we take, depending on, like you said, the part of the park mm -hmm. and the, the visitor segment that you're needing to manage the impacts of. And you're absolutely right. In the front country, you know, copious trash cans and recycling opportunities and a lot of messaging, a lot of messaging and mm -hmm. a lot of information. The way we work with the private sector and our concessioners, very much an ongoing, you know, never ending process to, to manage all of those inputs and outputs. You know, when it comes to the backcountry, though, that's a different user group. You know, that's mm -hmm. often a user group that's more educated, that's more experienced, that's more in tune with the leave no trace ethos. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's actually, it's not like it doesn't happen. I mean, certainly it's it happens. way less. Probably yeah. Respect. But I think, yeah, yeah, I think it's a segment that, that, that knows how to behave a little more so. And there's decades and decades of that kind of messaging. Leave no trace is, is a mantra that most people visiting parks for that kind of experience are very familiar with. We have a lot of nonprofits and partners we work with to get that kind of thing out there. So it can be a challenge, no doubt. And I'm sure, you know, our rangers who work in the backcountry and do that, that sort of monitoring, you know, uh, uh, cleanup, I'm sure is, is going to be a part of it. But um, yeah, a little bit different. I think we're seeing more impacts like graffiti. Mm -hmm. we, we do unfortunately see graffiti off trails that are closer to the front country that are a little more accessible especially out in the the desert southwest you know as um a lot of people have flocked to the outdoors in recent years graffiti is an ancient problem though right people have been carving you know i was here <laughs> on, on on nature for for a millennia so things like that unfortunately are something we have to always keep up on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Maybe now as we also get to the to the end of the episode, could you tell us a little bit about what are some current, maybe not challenges, but current kind of trends you also see and what's something that you think might impact your work or just the the system of the natural um, National Park Services in general? Yeah, I don't know if that's a too big of a question, <laughs> but yeah just your personal opinion you know you you analyze a lot of trends and a lot of uh, statistics so maybe <laughs> some yeah. knowledge you can share yeah absolutely so i'll mention two things that are, are pretty related i think so one thing we talked about already was some of the visitation trends we've seen in this mm -hmm. big old national park system i've described that a lot of it is tending to get kind of concentrated into some of the most famous well-known national parks i think that's because in this day and age we just have so many options for our leisure time We have more options than ever before with, mm -hmm. you know, computers and, and gaming and hobbies and everyone has their own little community, you know, their niche of, you know, I don't know, card collectors or some, you know, obscure hobby or not obscure, but, you know, something more niche. Yeah. And we've all kind of, you know, found these uh, uh, little uh, 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 variety of options and distractions and things we do with our leisure time. So when it does come to visiting a national park or heading out into nature, it tends to be those big, most well-known parks that attract people's attention, mm -hmm. you know, that they're more likely to kind of know about and think about visiting and, and go to. So one of the, the things I worry a little bit about that is, is sometimes I, I hope people are feeling connected with nature, not just when they're in the Grand Canyon or Glacier mm -hmm. National Park or Yellowstone or Acadia, I, I hope that people come back from those experiences and know that they are a part of nature. You're never not in nature. Nature is around you 24 hours a day. We are all part of, you know, the biome of this planet, right? Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes something I worry about is how parks have kind of segregated us from nature in a way, like in a mental construct, like, oh, I go over to a park and I'm in nature. And mm -hmm. you may not feel that quite as much when you're at home. So that's something I worry about because of climate change. And I, I hope people see how some of the most direct and immediate impacts of climate change are being experienced in our national parks. Mm -hmm. Glacier National Park probably won't have any glaciers by the end of the century. It's crazy. Yeah. Joshua Tree National Park may not have Joshua trees because of the, the heat and the changes in temperature and the intensity of wildfire. Yosemite National Park sometimes closes for days on end because of wildfires. 
So that's something I want people to be thinking about is these are amazing places to travel to and experience, but we need to be reducing our footprint. Obviously we need to be thinking about how we travel every single day, just because you go on vacation, you shouldn't turn off your, your brain about thinking about your impact on the planet. So I really encourage people to be thoughtful, you know, travel maybe close to home or via mass transit as often as possible. That's a little more difficult in the United States because it's so big mm-hmm. here. But if you're going to do one big trip, you know, maybe, you know, one long haul trip a year and really stay for quite a while. You know, don't try to jump around and see too much and take smaller flights within that big trip, you know, concentrate your trip and really immerse yourself in a destination. I think that's a good balance for, yes, experiencing this amazing, wonderful world and these amazing parks that are so great, but also you know, trying to do our part for, for the planet and for, for mm-hmm. everybody that has to live in this biome. So that's my wish is that people are making connections between their, their park experiences and, and their daily lives and some of these mm-hmm. 21st century challenges we have. Mm-hmm. That they come back basically inspired by the beauty that they've just seen to change maybe daily habits to protect not only, of course, you know, those incredible parks, but also, you know, the park, the the garden or the park next to your house. So just that you you really make that connection, like you said. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, now you just you already mentioned a little bit, but is there as my last question? I I thought you know you, I have a little trick question again for you, so please don't cheat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is there one, you know, apart from the really big parks, everyone knows, you know, those names where, yeah, everyone kind of sees a picture immediately. Um, is there one site or one unit of the system that you think doesn't get enough credit and that you would recommend to all of us if we're in the US the next time to visit? I'll even give you two. Very good. So to make up for that. So in Northern California, you can fly to Portland and Oregon and then take a wonderful two-week road trip down through Oregon and then into Northern California. The Redwoods National and State Parks, it's a combination, National Park and State Park System. The Redwoods on the coast of Northern California, it's jaw-dropping because it's some of the tallest, most massive trees in, in the world juxtaposed with the coastline. It's right Mm -hmm. there up against the coast of Northern California. I love the ocean, worked on those boats for a while, right? So for me, that juxtaposition, it's Mm -hmm. just so inspiring and it's rainy all the time. I love that kind of overcast weather. So Redwoods in Northern California, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site as well. Mm -hmm. And then also in Northern California, you could also head over to Lassen Volcanic National Park in Northern California, Lassen Volcanic. Think Yosemite, I'm sorry, not Yosemite, think Mm Yellowstone-ish. Big uh, alpine landscape, big mountains formed by volcanoes, Mm -hmm. three different kinds of volcanoes in the park. It's also located at a place geographically where three different ecosystems come together. Oh, wow. It's kind of a deserty, high desert to the east, and then you've got the Sierra Nevada mountains on the south, and then you have the Cascade Mountains going north, and it all kind of comes together to form this very unique and varied and dynamic landscape called Lassen Volcanic. It's just amazing. You can spend days there doing some wonderful hiking, small communities around, great camping. There's some, you know, huts and cabins and that sort of thing. I I think it's amazing. I would go there over Yellowstone. Yellowstone's amazing too, but I, I would probably go to Lassen, you know, more quickly than I would go to Yellowstone just because it's lesser known and not quite as crowded. Very good. So now I know where my next long haul trip uh, is going to be too. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all those insights and your little, you know, secrets. And uh, yeah, it was an honor having you on the podcast. I hope you had fun and thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure. That's it for this episode, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to share your thoughts on this episode and everything else that is going on at Smack with us by checking out our website at smack.media or connect with us on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Instagram. We'll see you next time.
If you're still around now, then I'm sure that you enjoyed this video. If so, you can check out another video here, subscribe to our YouTube channel or check out our other stuff just below. See you soon.